Today, we have a very special guest, uh, Professor Vargas Bustamante, is an assistant professor in the Department of Health Services at the University of California, Los Angeles School of Public Health. Uh, he teaches healthcare financing and organization and healthcare for vulnerable populations. He conducts research in two fields, healthcare disparities and health services in developing countries. His healthcare disparities research focuses on population groups that are overwhelmingly uninsured or that have poor access to health care, predominantly among Hispanics, Latinos, and immigrants. He also specializes in the statistical analyses of disparities in health care access, utilization, quality, and insurance coverage. His research on health services in developing countries focuses in two areas, cross-border health care utilization and health care privatization and decentralization in middle income countries, predominantly in Latin America. Professor Vargas holds a PhD in public policy, a master's in economics, and a master's in public policy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Vargas Bustamante. Thank you, Norma, and thank you very much uh, for hosting me today uh, to the university as well and uh, for inviting me to this lecture series. And uh, thank you very much for joining me today, all of them, those of you who are coming to my presentation. Uh, I, today I would like to present uh, two of my recent papers that I have published uh, regarding disparities between whites and Latinos. And one of the papers, it's uh, picturing disparities from the provider side while the other, the second paper pictures disparities from the uh, patient side. Um, the, order, the order of my presentation is the following. Uh, first, I would like to provide you with some background, some ba very basic demographics about Latinos and the forecast of how Latin, uh, the Latino population is, is expected to grow in the next uh, decades. Uh, then I want to summarize you uh, the, the findings of the first paper, uh, then the f findings of the second paper. And uh, I would like to conclude my presentation uh, trying to grab up the findings from these two papers in a way that we can discuss what uh, will happen with healthcare reform in the particular case of Latinos. Um, so here you can see that, uh, the, that some of the forecast uh, for a population growth from 2010 to 2050 shows uh, that three groups are gonna grow really fast uh, in the next 40, day, 40 years. Uh, they are highlighted here in red. And you can see that uh, the US population is expected to grow to almost 440 million by 2050. Uh, but the share of the population that is expected to grow faster is uh, both Latino, Asian, uh, and from a racial and ethnic group perspective, but also the foreign born. So in the next 40 years, uh, Latinos, immigrants, and Asians are going to become a population uh, of interest for healthcare providers and for decision makers who are involved in healthcare policy. Uh, in my presentations, uh, I always like to uh, start with these maps because not everyone is familiar with the uh, Latino population. Uh, I want to show this is the first map uh, of the Latino population in 1980 from the census. And you can see that most of the Latino population, uh, well, the darker, the blue, is the highest concentration of Latinos in that county. And you can see that uh, most of the Latino population was clustered in the Southwest and primarily like, close to the US-Mexico border. Uh, some of the Latinos were also living in the Florida area, primarily Cuban Americans, uh, Puerto Ricans and Dominicans in New York, some in the Chicago area. Uh, but I want you to see how the Latino population has been growing in 1990. You start seeing like some counties here in the Northwest, um, more counties in Florida, uh, this is in 2000, and this one is in 2006. You can see that here uh, the Latino population is increasingly growing in areas that were not traditional uh, destinations for Latinos. Uh, it's both uh, from uh, for the foreign born who are going to the areas where they can find jobs, uh, primarily in the South, but also in US born Latinos who are living places that were traditional. Uh, uh, traditional um, settlement places like California and Texas, and they are moving in the country. So 
those um, states that have uh, that, 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 that that experienced the highest uh, growth of Latino population in between 2000 and 2006 were non-traditional uh, Latino states. For example, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, South Dakota. Uh, while the, 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 the states that were more traditional Latino, like uh, California, Texas, uh, they were just like uh, experiencing a very low, low, low rate of growth. Um, the, right now, the, the five states with the highest uh, number of Latinos are, California, are still like traditional states like California, Texas, Florida, New York, and Illinois. And from a uh, metropolitan perspective, uh, LA is the city with the highest number of Latinos, uh, followed by Harris County, you're familiar with that county. Uh, Miami, uh, Cook, uh, this is the Chicago area, and Maricopa is the Phoenix area. So now that we know that Latinos are uh, increasing in number, uh, they are spreading out across the country, uh, I would like to uh, get into the first of my papers that I, uh, I just published with my colleague, Ji Chen, from CUNY, New York. Uh, this was recently published in Health Affairs, and it, anal it analyzes the perspectives of physicians in their ability to provide high-quality care uh, to the Latino population. Uh, the main motivation of this paper uh, was to understand uh, what are the main challenges that physicians encounter, because the Latino population is different to other vulnerable populations and to the white population. So we wanted to see whether we can find any uh, insights on how to improve healthcare delivery for Latinos. Uh, in the case of uh, previous research, uh, it has basically focused mostly in the patient's perspective. So we thought that it was an interesting uh, idea to see what providers had to say about it. Um, there are, were very few papers from the, from the provider side, uh, but those primarily focusing the disparities between uh, physicians treating whites and physicians treating African Americans. And also the previous papers primarily focused on primary care providers, so we decided to include specialists in our analysis. Uh, the main objective of this paper was to uh, uh, compare those physicians who uh, treated at least 50% uh, or more of their patients from Latin origin versus physicians who treated 50% uh, or more of white patients um, and analyze whether their ability to provide high quality care and the main problems that they encounter at uh, provider services to Latinos. Um, the data that we used in this paper is a 2008 health tracking physician survey that is a nationally representative sample of the U.S. physician population. Uh, this survey has a 62% response rate, and we used two different outcome measures. Uh, the first one is a perceived ability to provide high-quality care. Physicians answer to the survey saying whether they feel confident in their ability to provide high-quality care. And then the second is their ratings to eight common problems that physicians could encounter uh, while trying to administer high quality care. And they, they rated these problems as being major, minor, or no problem at all. Um, the conceptual model is a very famous model in the literature that analyzes uh, physician perceived quality of care that is called the Rescovy Scheme Framework. And according to this framework, um, quality, self perceived quality of care is determined by physician, practice, uh, patient, and market factors. And here you can see the, all the, con the explanatory variables that were included in the model and that were available in the survey, and they are classified as physician factors, practice factors, patient factors, and market factors. Um, the two population groups that we are comparing, uh, we are using the population, the physicians who treat at least 50% uh, or more uh, white patients as the reference group, and our comparison uh, category is uh, physicians with 50% or more uh, Latino patients. Uh, our statistical analysis is divided in three parts. Uh, first, we compare these two groups, the differences in means. Uh, then we run two types of regression analysis. The first regression analysis uh, fragments that is a quantile regression analysis where we basically divide it in five groups, in five cohorts, the share of Latinos that are treated by physicians. And then we analyze disparities based in each one of these uh, buckets. And then the second regression analysis is um, 
uh, a, a linear regression analysis that with using a composite measure. These composite measures basically collapse the eight categories that physicians rated as being major, minor, or no problems at all in one single measure. And we run an additional regression model as a sensitivity test uh, for each category, for each, for each one of the eight categories. Um, here are the main results. I think that, uh, well, the, of the differences in means of the first analysis. Uh, and I highlight that, that, that most, the most important one from my perspective in red. Um, because it, sh it, it shows that physicians who treat at 50% uh, or more Latino patients feel less confident in their ability to provide high quality care compared to the physicians who treat 50% uh, or more white patients. And this difference is statistically significant. Um, the index measure, that is the composite that, that uh, collapses the eight categories that are described later, uh, the difference is also statistically significant. And in each of the eight categories uh, that you have there, um, basically there are differences in all of them, uh, with the exception of two. That is uh, reject, reject, rejection, rejections of care by insurers. There are no differences in there. And there's no, there are no differences in medical uh, errors in hospitals. But uh, physicians who treat primarily Latino patients uh, are more likely to declare that uh, inadequate time with patients, reject, uh, patients' inability to pay, uh, lack of qualified specialists in the area, and not, get, not, not getting timely reports from other physicians, difficulties communicating with patients, and patients not compliance with treatment are more likely to happen than in the case of physicians who treat whites. Uh, once we run the, the control for all the, co the heterogeneity uh, with all the, our covariates in the concept that we're describing the conceptual framework, uh, we can conclude that uh, in the case of uh, primary care providers, the main challenges that they encounter are the patient's inability to pay. Uh, the second is the difficulties communicating with patients and patients not compliance with treatment. While in the case of specialists, uh, the main challenges encountered by physicians who treat primarily Latinos is the lack of qualified specialists in the area and not, get, not, not, not getting timely reports from other physicians. So from this paper, we can conclude that uh, physicians treating primarily Latino patients uh, are more likely to disagree on their ability to provide high quality care. And they also encounter more uh, difficulties while trying to administer uh, high quality care to uh, their patients compared to physicians who, are prim who treat primarily white patients. Uh, one of the findings that was kind of a, a paradox, and it's an interesting finding that uh, we weren't able to explain in the paper, was that f physicians of Latino origin felt more likely uh, more confident in their ability to, uh, to provide high quality care. Even though they still, if they had an increasing number of uh, Latino patients, they still disagreed that, on their ability to provide high quality care to this population. But the, the race of the physician here was uh, what was kind of a, an interesting finding that they felt more uh, confident in their ability to provide high quality care. Taking uh, in, uh, independent of uh, the amount of uh, Latino patients that they treat. So that's interesting for future research. Uh, now, from this, this paper was focused mostly from the provider perspective and picture disparities uh, for those physici physicians treating Latinos and whites. But in this second paper that I also published with my colleague Ji Chen uh, last year in health services research, um, we focus in disparities from the patient side, from the individual. And we, um, th this paper is uh, <laughs> about uh, health uh, spending disparities. Uh, and th the main motivation of this paper was that uh, we recently read there was a report that dispar disparities between the whites and Latinos and white and African Americans have evolved differently. In the last 10 years, uh, Latino white disparities have widened, while in the case of African Americans, they have remained constant. So it was some, we thought, uh, my colleague and I, that one possible explanation of, uh, that could be at play here is that uh, differences in the share of uh, foreign born populations within each racial and ethnic group. Uh, for instance, in the case of Latinos, almost 40% of Latinos are foreign born, uh, compared to only 7.7% .7 in the case of African Americans, or almost 4% in the case of whites. Um, and probably you know that immigrants are uh, self-selected. They are different to the native population in many characteristics, education, health, socioeconomic status. Um, and the previous research also showed that um, 
immigrants spend less uh, on healthcare primarily because they use it less, they need it less. So we investigate in this paper if uh, low spending among the foreign-born Latinos uh, contributes to health spending between Latinos as a whole and whites. And also we uh, are interested in analyzing some of the dynamics of how uh, spending evolves across cohorts. So we, want to see, we wanted to see if the disparities decline the longer the foreign-born population stays in the country, like the acculturation hypothesis, whether they, they resemble more the native population the longer they stay here. And also, if lower spending among Latinos uh, could be explained by self-selection among immigrants. Uh, the data that we use in this paper, uh, we decided uh, we, we linked uh, the medical uh, expenditure panel survey, probably better known as MEPS, and the National Health Interview Survey uh, for f from 2000 to 2007. Our total sample size is almost 30,000 Latinos and 76,000 whites, and we focus mostly in the adult population, 18 to 4, 64 years of age. Um, our four outcome, outcome measures are, two of those are dichotomous, whether the individual uh, had any health spending or whether they had an out-of-pocket spending, and the actual figure of uh, health spending and the, the share of out-of-pocket spending. Um, the population categories that we use in this paper are uh, non-Latino non whites is our reference group, and we basically fragment the Latino population uh, by those who were U.S. born and those who were bo foreign born. And among those who were foreign born, we distinguish between those who have been in the country less than 10 years and more than 10 years. And those who have been in the country less than 10 years, we call them uh, short stay, and more than 10 years is a uh, longer stay. And we include a series of covariates that, that, that previous, research, previous papers have included, uh, like uh, socioeconomic and demographic fa factors, uh, health status, chronic disease condition, interview language to proxy for native language, uh, health insurance coverage, as usual source of care, and survey years for uh, uh, in case of uh, unobserved time effects. Um, the statistical, in the, the statistical analysis, we, is also the, we also did a means comparison to analyze the data at the beginning. Uh, then we did a um, two-part model uh, where we run two regressions uh, for each of the dependent variables. In the first part of the regression, we used the dichotomous measure for whether have, they had health spending or not. Uh, and then among those who had health spending, we run a second regression in the, the second part of the model where we actually use the log health spending measure to analyze disparities between whites and Latinos. Uh, by city. And we also uh, uh, use the nativity <coughs> dimension and the um, citizenship one. Like, no, no, nativity is what U.S. born on, uh, or, or U.S. born or foreign born, and also the, 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 whether they are longer stay or short stay. So we do all this in all these two-part two part models. And finally, we run a, a third uh, statistical analysis uh, using the blinder Oaxaca decomposition technique to parse out observed and unobserved health spending factors. Uh, we use this primarily to deal with the, the issue of self-selection among immigrants to try to disaggregate the disparities, taking, taking into consideration the unobserved factors. Um, there's uh, several tables, several results, but I don't want you to, like, I don't have that much time to do that, to show you all that. So this is, like, the, the bottom line of the findings. You can see that um, uh, in the upper part, this, this line is health spending each of the years. This is uh, health spending, that, right, per capita health spend, spending from zero to 5,000. And you can see that this is the white um, population. Every single year, the white population has higher health spending than any of the three Latino categories. Uh, the naturalized Latinos, with, together with the U.S.-born Latinos, they are closer in this range. And the non-citizen uh, are in this, uh, this range. In the case of the out-of-pocket share, uh, you, can, you can see that basically the, the graphs flipped. And here is the non-citizen um, Latino who has a really high uh, share of their spending is out of pocket. That is probably explained by the high number of uninsured in this population group. And here you can see that it's almost undistinguishable the white out of pocket spending 
to, uh, compared to the US born Latinos and the naturalized Latinos spending. So summarizing all the different uh, models that, I, that, that we run in, the, in this paper, uh, we conclude, well, we will find that uh, non citizen Latinos consistently demonstrate lower spending uh, than whites and other Latino categories. And for the four measures, also disparities narrow or disappear for naturalized Latinos. So this could be a good um, indication of uh, gradual assimilation uh, in the three regression models. And also disparities for long-stay Latinos tend to uh, narrow just a little bit or remain constant. This is probably also due to the uh, unobserved factors such as immigration status. And Low spending among short state immigrants uh, could be possible. There, there's a high uh, share of the unobserved factors that uh, we find in the, uh, in the last model that we could explain as uh, the healthy immigrant effect or whether Latinos spend less in, in health primarily because they don't need it, because they are healthy. So from this paper, we can conclude that Latino white disparities are large, and particularly among non-citizen Latinos, and those who have been in the country less than 10 years. Um, the second part of the, the dynamic analysis also shows gradual convergence uh, of health spending between whites and naturalized Latinos. And lower spending can be also be explained by positive self-selection. So now that I have uh, shown you these two, the findings of these two papers were on, on, in one of the, the, of the other papers, I showed, we, we showed the uh, challenges that physicians encounter at delivering high quality care to Latinos, and in the other, the low health care spending, and that is a reflection of lower utilization and access to care from the patient perspective. Uh, I would like to conclude my presentation discussing how the ACA could impact Latinos. Uh, Latinos right now have the highest uh, share of uninsured population in the U.S. Uh, right, they are at 35% compared to 10% for the white population. So, and the ACA is very likely to benefit people who are low income and middle income uninsured individuals through three, type, three policies. Uh, that the first one is the insurance exchanges and the subsidies that will be provided in, in, in these exchanges. The second is the increased Medicaid eligibility from 133 to 400% the federal poverty level. And the third one is the additional funding for the federally qualified health centers and community clinics. Uh, as if we could only read up to here, we will think that Latinos will be the main beneficiaries of the ACA, primarily because they have one of the highest, that well, the highest uninsured rate in the country. However, there are some, this is only a, will apply to those who are uh, native-born Latinos or who have been in the country for more than five years. Basically, the, those who, immigrants who have been more than five years in the country are, basically have the same entitlements and also responsibilities to pay, to, to, to um, observe the mandate as the native-born population. However, this is not the case for those uh, immigrants who have been in the country for less than five years, since they will remain ineligible for Medicaid uh, they will have access to the exchanges, uh, but they won't uh, benefit from the Medicaid subsidies. So it will be challenging for this population because they will have to either pay the penalty uh, if they cannot afford the products that are offered in the exchanges. And as we already know, the undocumented population is excluded from this uh, uh, legislation. So they don't have to pay the penalty, but they don't have to, uh, they're not eligible for the subsidies in the exchanges or, from, or for Medicaid. Any of, or any of the uh, benefits in Medicaid. However, the undocumented population is uh, usually is one of the main groups that uh, uses services at the federally qualified health centers. So the additional funding for the community clinics could trickle down indirectly to the undocumented population as, as well, especially if these uh, policies improve, the policies to improve uh, healthcare delivery in community clinics are uh, effective and they can reach this population. Um, however, there are two possibilities that the undocumented population can be affected by the ACA. And one is for the small share of undocumented immigrants who right now have insurance. Uh, their employers may have incentives to drop coverage if they decide to buy insurance through the exchanges. And if in the exchanges uh, immigration status is verified, then those undocumented immigrants who have insurance right now may lose coverage. 
And in the other, ca in the other cases, for those undocumented immigrants who pay taxes, um, they may still want to pay the penalty. So they won't uh, uh, flag the, a federal agency, the IRS, that they are undocumented. So they could be affected because uh, they, they will still be uninsured, and on top of that, they will have to pay the penalty. So it's still uncertain uh, how they will react to it, uh, how it's going to be implemented. But this is up to now what I have, I have uh, more or less understood from different uh, forums and experts uh, that could be undocumented could be uh, affected by the ACA. Um, however, all the other policies that are more um, oriented towards improving healthcare coordination and improving uh, patient um, follow-up, for example, using electronic medical records that are linked to the ACA are likely, to, if, the, if effective, are likely to benefit uh, treatment for the Latino population. Um, ultimately, the most important thing uh, is that when the ACA gets implemented, uh, we as uh, researchers and policymakers will have to uh, procure that access to high quality, affordable, and culturally competent care should remain a priority uh, to solve the problems that we that uh, my colleague and I showed that were basically the communication problems and those linked to inability to pay. Uh, well, thank you very much, and I, I'm open for questions. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, but I think that the, the question that the way it was asked, it was not necessarily, it was one of the language situation that they, they don't speak English very well, but also the fact that how to communicate uh, that, that, that a traditional patient provider communication. It's, sometimes it differs because they have experiences with different types of healthcare systems. So once they come here, that, that, that relationship is different. So in communication, you can put, like as you said, like the possibilities of different dialects, different languages, but also of a, that relationship of how the interaction between the provider and the physician and different expectations from the two sides. Yep. Oh, Affordable Care Act. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So we, we have, to, uh, thank you, Dr. Okay. Buscamante, but I don't want, uh, Vargas Buscamante, I don't want you to leave, but we do have time for more questions from yeah, our live audience only. Okay. So um, if you have a question, please press the, the thing. In the in the expenditures one, or in the physicians one, the expenditures one, uh, socioeconomic and demographic factors, income, education, age. Mm. Uh, well, th those are. The basic, they, they cannot be modified. They, they, they are primarily the, the population heterogeneity. Yeah. So the only thing that yeah. basically can be changed is that, that the share of the usual source of care, un, un, uninsured, in, insured, uninsured status. You know? And there's like that, that, that little unobserved factor, right? That is usually like, like where you can include discrimination and cultural differences. But it's, it's a very small compared to the demographics yeah. uh, and socio 
sociodemographic and population specific factors like health status and they are just so different between the reference and the comparison groups. Oh, this is the difference in means. Thank you. Yeah. I'm wondering, you know, uh, it's really interesting to see how many of the variables were significant. Uh -huh. And the variables, in my mind, can kind of be split into two categories themselves, like structural issues mm -hmm. of, you know, time, inability to pay, okay. and then more individual mm -hmm. level issues of communication, noncompliance. Um, did you see if there were correlations between mm -hmm. the variables at all? Yes, we did, we did that. Um, and that, yes, there is correlation. Yeah. Could you expand what they were? Which ones you found? I don't recall them very well because it was uh, in that one of the last of the tables. Uh, but um, the inter uh, correlation. I, I honestly, sorry, I don't. Okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's in the paper. Yeah, but why? Why did you bring that up? Like, uh, I would like to address that 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 comment. What do you think is important that we have that correlation there? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I'm a sociologist, mm -hmm. so I see the interplay of structure and individual agency all the time, and mm -hmm. so. I'm just wondering, um, as far as, you know, studies on patient noncompliance have shown that clinic atmosphere makes a difference, not only the physician, but other uh, structural yeah. factors. So, you know, things like that were just kind of red flags to me, like, as far as the correlations there. Okay. I was always I was also interested in the correlation as well with the non-compliance and difficulties communicating because sometimes non-compliant, we, we label it as non-compliant and it just really could be communication they don't, you know, which is really understood. Yeah, exactly. and that's, that's, that's important to state that it's also like the perceived, yeah. uh, it is how phys physicians perceive the problems, right? Yeah. As major or minor, that's perceived might be different to real. There's a measurement error. Possibility. Yeah, this is, but with even if it's a, a, a study of self-perception, I think it's still important to picture that the perceivability is different among those physicians who treat different populations. No, no, it's a national representative survey. Yeah, and includes physicians who are from the AMA and those who are not in the AMA. Yeah, it's a nationally representative survey of all physicians in the country. Yeah. I have a related question when there's been a geographical difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we include that. I cannot re answer to that, but we did include the geographic controls, and only to uh, to reduce the heterogeneity in the in the in the regression models. But uh, I, I think that, um, as far as I remember, yes, uh, there was in that, and it's not a state control; it's a regional control. That's why we didn't think, like uh, show it in the end in the tables because it was not that indicative of anything. But uh, th those in the south and in the west were more likely 
to observe like a higher inability to provide high quality care. Mm -hmm. You mentioned this problem about that there's no good communication between the physician and the uh -huh. patients. And how do you think it could be resolved? You need like better translators or will you have to put the Latinos with Latino physician or what yeah. would be the, the way to resolve this problem? There, I think there's uh, d different ways in when you can address this. One is like making, uh, bringing awareness to providers that populations are different and perceive healthcare differently. So by doing that, providers, not only physicians, like nurses, medical assistants, everyone, could like uh, understand how to approach this population better. And also for those who have like um, English, uh, challenges, of course, translators and all the guidelines that have been like encouraged for some years. Uh, uh, materials, everything has to be, if possible, translated to the different uh, Asian languages and Spanish, primarily. Those are the new, mo like uh, the most important uh, immigration ways that are in the U.S. Train the providers how to deal with different types of. That's right, different types. That, no, but they also have to. They also have to like help because sometimes these people come with very different health beliefs, right? That they, they expect antibiotics or things that are not necessarily good for your health. So the, the, the physicians have to be like uh, helping that transition for them to assimilate into the healthcare system. Eventually, many, most immigrants are going to stay, and they want to become Americans. So they have to be dealing with a system that is uh, different to their, to their hometown health system. So it's a transition where they have to understand that they come from a different health system, but they also have to get used to the new rules, to the new system. So that's important. It's, uh, physicians and providers have to help them in how to manage that, especially for more recent immigrants or people who are not very uh, used to access the healthcare system from other racial and ethnic minorities. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. But on your um, on your respondents, or you measured that your physicians were greater than fifty percent Latino, or less than ten percent yes. of the whole. What did that do as far as location? How we adjusted for geographic, but in, in whole numbers, how many of those were from the rest of the uh, of the nation other than border in New York and Chicago? Uh -huh. Well, that, that's adjusted by the weights in the in the observations. I know it's suggested, uh -huh. but do you remember the physical number? No. Were there any in other parts of the U.S.? No, I, I cannot. I cannot recall that. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Uh -huh. Well, as I, as I mentioned in, in the, that second paper, is one is the healthy immigrant effect. Im immigrants have to be healthy to come to this country, so they, they need to care less. Uh, the second one is the access situation. They don't have insurance. They, they don't uh, have easy access to health services. So that, that's a second explanation. And um, the third is, a, is, is part of the unobserved component that I was unable to picture in the paper, but it's also like the cultural uh, situation or that they probably have a less likelihood of uh, trying to spend, like a, they avoid spending health, uh, for health, uh, for, health uh, for medicines, for health services as much as possible. They're more restrictive on that compared to others. They prefer to buy a car, for example, rather than having insurance, while other uh, racial and ethnic groups would be more likely to prefer having insurance to buying a car or something like that. So for those that are insured, mm -hmm. why, for those that mm -hmm. are insured, why do they spend less money? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, because then, then they, it's because they are more healthy. Yeah. So even if they are covered, they need it less. And also, the, remember that the Latinos are, health, are younger on average than whites. So a higher proportion of uh, as people age that they have to use healthcare more. So since whites are older, then they will be more likely to spend more money than Latinos. So the, 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 the patterns that right now you, you're seeing with the white population, you may be seeing them in Latinos in 40 years when a, a, a considerable chunk of the Latin population is gonna age as well. There's also the possibility that those living by borders are crossing into Mexico and getting healthcare. 
Yeah, I think that that's also another possibility, but I don't think that it will reflect that many, that, 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 that wouldn't be that significant to explain lower spending. Yeah. I do research on that area, and it's very, it's, it's, I think it's a little overstated, the amount of healthcare that is received across the border. Uh -huh. For all oh, from these findings, uh, well, now we are working on uh, medical bankruptcies and see how um, the financial crisis affected uh, Latinos versus whites and how lacking health insurance. Do you remember that we have like the out of pocket spending is much higher among non citizens? whether that looked ref was reflected in worse foreclosures, no, in worse uh, um, uh, bankruptcies due to medical spending. Because people who were buying house but without health insurance and after the financial crisis of 2008, whether that was uh, worse for Latinos versus whites. That's why we're working right now. Yeah. Qualitative, yeah. Uh, I actually, uh, right now, I'm working together with one of my, uh, he's a visiting scholar from the Commonwealth Fund at Harvard University. And we are collaborating in, we have a grant together with another researcher from UCLA who is um, comparing uh, medical assistance with community health workers uh, in Northern California. And one of the components is doing a, a qualitative study. So this, this, this person, Philippe, and, and I are going to go and do some qualitative work and see whether uh, medical assistants and community health workers feel about providing healthcare to diabetic patients. I like to do both uh, qualitative and quantitative. For most of my research is quantitative. I also like the qualitative part, yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking in terms of the rejection of care by insurers. Yeah. And you get, you get many very important insights when you do qualitative work as well. Sometimes in these big services, I, I, there are some questions that I would love, love to answer, but you cannot because it's very, very limited in the type of measures, right? Uh, but in the qualitative work, you, know, you can go in depth into asking these very precise uh, questions that you want to know about. Anything else? Right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you.